hey, Shelter Rock Church, this is Pastor Henry here, and it's great to be with you today. We're glad that you're joining us online. And as you can see, we're doing something a little bit different today for the sermon recording. Uh, this is the first time, actually, we're filming inside this location. It may be unfamiliar to you, but it's not unfamiliar to me. We're actually in my home today. Uh, we're actually sitting here at my dinner table in the center of my house. Uh, we, we moved into this house about 10 years ago. In fact, it's almost exactly 10 years to the day. And when we moved into this space, it was a wreck. It needed so much work. In fact, there was a pipe that burst. It caused uh, damage. We had to rip up the floors and the walls. We had to have everything around you that you see gutted. And we had to, to do it ourselves. And so we put in new floors. We put in new walls. We did new electric and plumbing. I had a lot of help with family and friends. And I picked up some skills along the way. I learned how to build and do some things with my hands. But of all the things that I've created over the last 10 years in this home, of all the things I've built, my favorite thing is this table. You know, I built this table with a friend uh, with lumber bought from a lumber yard just around the corner. And I love this table. In fact, if you look underneath, our family signed our names beneath the bottom of it. But I love this table for so many reasons, but mostly it's because it sits in the center of our house. And for me, it really represents like where life happens in our family. You know, life happens around this table, right? We have meals together at this table. We have breakfast and, and lunch and, and dinner around this table. We have, we have conversations that are important around this table. We play family board games or card games or do other activities around this table. Uh, this table really is a place where those who I love most and those who are closest to me always know they have a seat. And when our kids were little, there were high chairs sitting around this table. And now as they get older, they're still seated around this table together. Uh, sometimes around this table, there's conflict. I'm sure around my table as in yours. Um, but there's always a place here of connection, of belonging, of love, and of family. The, the, the table is the center of our lives. And so it's my favorite thing I built because already over the last 10 years, we've made so many memories at this table and we've built connection with one another as a family. You know, not just anyone sits around your table. If we went around your dining room table today, I bet those who are closest to you, those who you're in deepest connection with, those are the ones who have a seat at that table. Well, today we're going to look at God and we're going to continue our series, Look at God. But what we're going to do is we're going to look at who God invites to his table. Who are the people that have a seat at Jesus's table? Who are the people who are invited? Who are the people who belong? Who are the people that can find connection and belonging with him? One of the interesting things about Jesus, and we're going to look at Jesus today as we continue this teaching series, one of the interesting things about Jesus is you'll notice Jesus did so much of his ministry around a table like this. It's something theologians call table fellowship, and it was really important in the first century in Judaism. In fact, you can see throughout Luke's gospel, Jesus has 10 different meals with different people all throughout the book. He's in Levi's house. He's in, he's in Simon's house. He's, he's around the table with his disciples time and time again. Jesus is at a table. So much so that one scholar says in Luke's gospel, Jesus is either coming to a meal, at a meal, or leaving a meal. Right? Time and time again, Jesus is around people with, uh, around the table with people in his life. And it's because in the first century, in Judaism, in ancient cultures, as well as in Eastern cultures today, the table, the family dinner table, is highly symbolic. It's a place where people can find belonging and connection. Typically, you'd, you'd surround yourself with people that would help elevate your social status or reputation and people uh, who you would honor as your guests and then they would reciprocate and do that in response. But what we see is Jesus upends the cultural norms of his time. He doesn't invite only the rich to the table, but the poor. He doesn't just invite those who have means to reciprocate, but even those who can't. In fact, Jesus goes so far to sit down and eat with tax collectors and sinners and prostitutes, people that otherwise had been cast away. And yet Jesus says, these are the people who are invited to have a seat at my table. 
this truth that God invites us, all of us, no matter who we are, to sit down at his banquet, it's a truth that really reveals the doctrine of the grace of God. That we have a God who is gracious, who is full of grace towards us. We're going to talk about God's grace today, which I want to define for us as God's, um, God's free gift that is totally unexpected, unmerited, and undeserved. God's free gift, which is totally unexpected, unmerited, and undeserved. It's totally unearned, and yet it's a free gift that he offers to each of us. And when we talk about the character of God, you and I need to be reminded that we have a God who is full of grace, who is gracious towards us, and that's all of us. And we see that exemplified in Luke's gospel. And I'm going to look at one of those examples today. We're going to study it together where Jesus sits at the table with someone you would least expect. I'm going to read through the text, then we'll unpack it together and then draw out some implications for us today. Uh, Luke chapter 19, story is likely familiar to some of you kids who are watching. You've probably heard it in Sunday school, um, but we're going to look at it fresh today. Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. It says this. It says that Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and he welcomed him gladly. Notice this. All the people saw this and began to mutter. He is gone in to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said, Lord, Lord, look, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times that amount. Jesus said to him, today, Salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save the lost. This is such a rich text for us today. And I think sometimes we look at the story of Zacchaeus and we think it's just a children's story. But I want to I want to reclaim it for you and for me today. This is not just a children's story. This is a story of a man who is desperate to see Jesus, right? A sinner who's been outcast and marginalized and, and shunned from all of society and no longer connected to the community of faith. He's on the outside and yet he hears about Jesus and he wants to see Jesus and he acts in this crazy way. He runs ahead, he climbs a tree and just to see Jesus, but he's trying to do it anonymously. But Jesus sees him. He calls him by name. And by the end of the text, he calls him a son of Abraham, restoring him to the community of faith. See, it's a story of a man who, in his desperation for transformation, went and found Jesus. And when he encountered him, he encountered the grace that only Jesus can bring. And it transformed his life and has the power to transform our lives as well. I want to unpack the text little by little. I want to go through again, verse by verse, but I'm going to show you some things in the text together that we're going to uncover. First, notice, first of all, it says Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. Uh, we know as we read the rest of Luke that Jericho is about 15 miles from Jerusalem. Jesus is on his way through Jericho to Jerusalem. Now he's going to the cross. You read the rest of Luke and you know he's going to his death. The book's only got five chapters left. He's, he's going to go into Jerusalem. He's going to go into the temple. He's eventually going to go into the cross and he's going to lay down his life for you and for me for the forgiveness of our sins. And this is important because here we are. We're just a couple of weeks away from Good Friday. But right here, Jesus is just a couple of weeks away from the cross. He's on his way to his death to lay down his life for sinners. But on his way he encounters a notorious sinner and he stops and he pauses and he meets him on the way. It says, verse 2, a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. I'm going to stop there. That name Zacchaeus, it's a Jewish name. It's a Hebrew name. And actually, it's a name that means literally innocent or pure, which is ironic because when you get to know Zacchaeus and what he does for a living, you know that he's anything but innocent and pure. He's not living up to his given name. We know this because he was a chief tax collector and 
was wealthy. Tax collectors in that society, who were Jewish, were sort of collaborators with Rome. They, they, they were working with Rome to oppress um, the Jewish people, right? Uh, Rome had levied a tax that was unfair and unjust on the Jewish people, and they employed Jewish people to exact and extract that tax from their own people. So, so a tax collector would be someone who would be perceived as a traitor, someone who had abandoned his own people to work for the enemy. That's what Zacchaeus was. But he wasn't just any tax collector. The text says that he was a, a chief tax collector, Right? And that he was wealthy. We know that the tax collectors would get wealthy by charging more than Rome was requiring. So if Rome was requiring one denarius in tax, a tax collector might come up and say, give me two denarii. And they would give one to Rome and take the other one and put it in their pocket. So Zacchaeus had gained his wealth by defrauding his own people whom he had Betrayed, And so as a result, he was hated. In fact, in that culture, if you wanted to insult someone, you wanted to tell them how terrible they were, you wanted to give them the worst name possible, you'd call them a tax collector. In our culture, at least in my world, I'm a Mets fan, right? So if you want to insult someone, you might call them a Yankees fan. It's like the worst, the lowest of the low, the worst thing you could call someone. I'm just kidding if you're a Yankee fan. Um, but in that culture, calling someone a tax collector was an insult. Zacchaeus is a chief tax collector. He's the chief of sinners in their day. Verse 3 says he wanted to see who Jesus was. Now, we don't know why he wanted to see Jesus, but we know that he wanted to see who Jesus was. Supposedly, he had heard about Jesus. He had heard about his reputation. we, We don't know if this is true, but I like to speculate a little bit that it's possible that this chief tax collector heard about this Savior who had received other tax collectors into his fold. Remember Matthew, Matthew, who wrote the gospel, was a follower of Jesus. Remember, he was a tax collector before he was a disciple. He left his tax booth to follow Jesus. I wonder, maybe Zacchaeus had heard of this reputation of this man who welcomed even the worst of sinners. So he's desperate to see Jesus. And we know he's desperate because it says that, uh, uh, but, but because he was short, He could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. Now, the Bible doesn't normally comment on people's outward characteristics, right? Man looks at the outside, but God looks at the heart. But here it's important, right? He's short. And that's a phrase. It means he was of small stature in Greek. It's a phrase that would only be used if someone was likely less than five feet tall. So he's He's not just short, he's really short, and he's unable to see over other people to see Jesus. So he runs ahead. Now, I want you to notice really quickly, running ahead was not something men would do in this culture, especially wealthy men. It was considered uh, something children would do. And yet, he's so desperate to see Jesus, he doesn't mind humbling himself like a child to go and see Jesus. Kind of reminds me of the prodigal son, right? Remember the father, just a few chapters earlier? He runs to meet his son. He's not afraid of what other people are going to think, right? He just runs after him. Zacchaeus is running after to see Jesus. Then he he acts even more like a child. He climbs a sycamore fig tree to see Jesus. Climbing trees, again, that's something just children would do. But he climbs this tree to see Jesus. Now, what's interesting, at least to me, is that sycamore fig trees don't grow in high elevation areas. They grow in low elevation areas like Jericho. It's actually the topography of the land fits. It's one area where um, archaeology and geography seem to verify what the Bible says because you can go to Jericho today and see sycamore fig trees just like this one. They're everywhere. And so he climbs the sycamore fig tree. He climbs up desperate to see Jesus. But these sycamore fig trees had these big leaves where you could hide. So he's not looking to get spotted. Then I want you to notice what happens next. Jesus reaches the spot. He reaches the spot where he doesn't want to get spotted. And he looked up and he said to him, what does Jesus say? Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. I love how Jesus, number one, calls him by his name, right? He sees him, he spots him, he calls him out, he blows up his cover, and he calls him down. And then Jesus invites him over into his house. I must stay at your house today. This would have been a great honor and a great shock, quite honestly, to everybody listening in that Jesus was inviting himself over into Zacchaeus's house because 
Jesus was really saying, Zacchaeus, I'm not afraid to associate myself with you. I'm going to come into your house and I'm going to be with you and I'm going to stay over there tonight. Likely everyone expected Jesus to rebuke Zacchaeus, to call him out for being a sinner, for being a traitor. And instead, Jesus says, I want to, I want to seat at your table and I want to sit with you. Uh, Zacchaeus gladly, the text says, comes down and welcomes him. And then all the people saw this and began to mutter. And they said, he is gone to be the guest of a sinner. You know, they meant that as an insult, right? He's gone in to be the guest of a sinner, but truer words have never been spoken. When we talk about the character of God and who God is, and we talk about the graciousness of God and how we have a God who is full of grace, it's a reminder that every single one of us are undeserving of God's love, that we can't earn God's love or God's favor or God's presence, but that every single one of us are recipients of his grace, just like Zacchaeus. He's gone in to be the guest of a sinner. He did it with Zacchaeus, and the truth is, he does it with you and with me today. This is a text that really highlights the grace of God. It removes all pretense, all um, achievement. It, it reminds us that we could never earn God's favor. You and I are like people who are hiding away from him, and yet he calls us out by name, and he invites us into his presence. God's grace does at least three things. And I want to look at each together today for a few minutes. Uh, three things that God's grace does that we see in our text. Number one, God's grace pursues us. Uh, secondly, we see God's grace unsettles us. And third, God's grace transforms us. First, God's grace pursues us. I believe God's grace is pursuing each and every one of us today. And that if you're here and you're seeking and you're watching and maybe you're just checking church out or reading the Bible for the first time or maybe for a long time, I just believe God is in pursuit of a people who've wandered and strayed away from him. Right? He's he's seeking after Zacchaeus. You read the text and it seems as though Zacchaeus is doing all of the seeking. And he is, right? He's, he's looking to see Jesus. He's running. He's climbing. He even goes up on a tree to try and be able to catch a glimpse of Jesus. But the truth is, had Jesus not stopped, had Jesus not looked, had Jesus not called him by name, no one else would have known he was there. See, Jesus identifies himself as the seeker. He says it at the very end of the text. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. The truth is Zacchaeus was seeking after God, but the deeper truth is that God was seeking after him. That God was pursuing him. That Jesus, although he was on his way to Jerusalem, made a stop to meet a man, to spend time in his home, to, and, and to, to give him, uh, to restore him back into his presence and to the community of faith, to offer forgiveness for his sins, right? He did all of that because he was seeking him. You read the text and you think, wow, Zacchaeus went through great lengths to seek after Jesus. And I want to say, no, 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 actually, Jesus went through great lengths to seek after him and to seek after you and to me. This is why he left glory. This is why he left heaven. This is why he left eternity to break into our world. This is why he came. This is why he lived. This is why he died, to seek after you and me. The Son of Man came to seek and save those who were lost, whether they be lost sheep that's wandered from the 99, a lost coin or a lost son or a lost daughter. Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost and bring back to him. And that means that there's no one here, no one who's watching today. There is no one who is too far from God. No one who is too far from God. You may wander away, but I just wanna let you know, we have a God who will chase after you because there's no one who's too far gone from him. Uh, there's no one who's not known by God. You may feel invisible, you may feel unseen, you may feel like you know no one knows, no one cares. It's just not true. Right? Zacchaeus was up there in the tree, hidden, and yet Jesus knows him. He calls him by name. How did Jesus know his name? We're not told. But as he walks by, he sees him, and he knows him, and he calls him, and he calls him down, and he spends time with him. Jesus knows him, which means there is no one who's not known by God. It also means there's, there's never a reason to hide from God. 
Never a reason to hide from God. You and I, Adam and Eve, it goes back to the garden, right? They sinned and they hide from God with fig leaves. And now Zacchaeus, he's hiding with what? Sycamore fig leaves, right? It's as old as creation. We, we, we sin and we fall short of God's glory. And that leads us sometimes to shame and, and, and guilt. And, and, and there's a guilt that really should lead us to repentance and then faith in God. But there's another guilt that keeps us running away from him. I can't open up my Bible. It's just been too long. I haven't done it in so long, so I just can't do it. I, I, I can't talk to God. He's not going to listen to me. It's just been too long since I've prayed to him, so he's not going to hear me. I can't come back to church. You know, there's no way they'd accept me. It's been two years. The pandemic started two years ago, but I haven't been back. So I, I can't go back because there's no way God would receive me. It's just not true. There's never a reason to hide from God. See, we have a God who we don't need to hide from. We actually have a God who, who welcomes us, who calls us, who invites us into his presence and to experience the transformation that his presence brings. God's grace pursues us. Secondly, we see in our text that God's grace unsettles us. Let's be honest, God's grace is, is scandalous. It, it sort of unsettles and perturbs and disturbs us a little bit. And, and it does the people that were surrounding by Jesus. Look at verse Look at verse 7. All the people saw this and began to mutter. That word mutter, it's uh, it's the word for grumble. It's onomatopoetic, right? It's I don't know if I'm saying that word right, but it's like it, it, it sounds like what it is, right? They're sort of muttering and grumbling, and they say he's gone in to be the guest of a sinner, right? So 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 the, the religious people who are walking with Jesus, who are following Jesus, who've been journeying with Jesus, who've been listening to Jesus, who've been shaped and formed by Jesus, who've been discipled by Jesus for likely some time, right? You got a whole crowd of people that are following and walking with Jesus. Likely they've left their nets to follow him. Likely they've left their jobs to follow him. Likely they've they thought, oh, there, there must, this maybe this is the Messiah. Maybe this is the Savior. Maybe this is the promise. And they're putting their hope and faith in following him. And those same religious people who've heard the words of Jesus, who've seen the healings of Jesus, who've experienced the grace of Jesus, those same religious people, they, it seems as though they don't mind when the grace of God is brought to them, but they can't really stomach when it's offered to someone who they perceive as less deserving as themselves. And so they begin to grumble, they begin to mutter, he's gone in to be the guest of a sinner. See, I think what's happening in the text is these religious people, these people who've been following Jesus, they've sort of got an us and them mentality, right? They're sort of the deserving uh, sinners like us. We deserve God's grace. We've earned God's grace. We've left all of these things to follow you. So of course, like God's gonna, God's gonna bless me. God's gonna, Jesus is gonna sit down and eat with me. We're deserving of his presence. But these other people, these traitors, these tax collectors, these people like Zacchaeus, Man, they're undeserving sinners. They've got this us and them mentality. And Jesus takes that distinction, that barrier, that separation, and he dismantles it. He breaks it down. He says, no, you can grumble all you want, but actually, I came for those who are sick. I came for the sinners. I came for those who are aware of their sin and longing for forgiveness, longing for connection, longing for belonging. I came for people like him. You know, I came across a quote this week, which I got to be honest with you, the first time I read it, it was pretty jarring. And um, I, I just, but, but I had a chance to reflect on it a little bit this week. And I, and I really just think it sort, of, it sort of captures the point here. Listen to this. It says, um, hell is full of people who think they deserve heaven. And heaven is full of people who know they deserve hell. Yeah, I, I think that's right, right? Hell is full of people. Judgment, you know, you know separation from God. It's, it's full of people who think they deserve heaven, right? I'm, I'm good enough. I, I've, I've done the right thing. I've, I've, got, I've, I've obeyed all the rules. I've, I've, I've done the right thing. I've, I've, I've given money to the church. I've, gone to church. I've done all these kind acts. I'm better than my neighbor and other people around me. So, so, but, but hell is full of people who think they deserve heaven, but heaven is populated by people who know they deserve hell who know we're not good enough, who know we could never meet God's standards, who know that we are sinners who've fallen short of the glory of God and who've looked to Jesus for our strength, for our salvation, for our forgiveness. It doesn't make us any better than anyone else, right? It's an understanding that everything we have 
is because of grace. I, mean, I, think of, I think of the cross. I think when Jesus was on the cross, you know, there, was, there were two people, one on each side of him, both criminals, both guilty, both being executed alongside of him. You remember one of them was mocking him and, and, and calling him names and, and, and giving him a hard time and, and, and all sorts of things and just joining in the ridicule of Jesus. And yet the other one who was, who was guilty of his own sin, he looked to Jesus and he said, remember me today when you enter into your kingdom. And Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. Right? I th- we, we, we each, we're all sinners. We've all fallen short. And yet in our world, there really are only two responses to Jesus. You can think, well, you know, for, forget who you are. Forget who you say you are. I'm going to trust in myself for my own self-sufficiency, uh, for my own salvation. And you know what? The truth is it'll never work. Or there are people who look to Jesus and trust in him for the salvation that only he can bring, who rely not on their own merit or their own record, but sheerly on his grace. And for all those who respond to Jesus in repentance and faith and trust in his grace alone, you will be forever with God in paradise. You know, God's, God's grace is scandalous. God's grace is unsettling, right? There's there's nothing, especially in a performance-based culture, there's nothing you and I could do to earn it or achieve it. God's grace unsettles us. God's grace pursues us. God's grace, if we're honest, it unsettles us. But most importantly, if we receive God's grace, if we respond to God's grace, if we respond to his invitation the way Zacchaeus did, coming down gladly to receive the free gift that he offers, God's grace has the power to transform us. Look at the end of the text. It says, uh, Zacchaeus stood up, verse 8, and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of all my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. Look at how Zacchaeus responds to the grace of God of Jesus, right? He responds by extending that same grace to others. He goes above and beyond the requirements of the law. He goes beyond what is required. He says, I'm going to give half of all of my possessions to the poor and I'll pay back four times of anyone that I've cheated. Now, I just want to let you know, this is not the thing that guarantees his salvation. Remember, we were saved sheerly by grace. It's not by works, right? We are saved by faith uh, through grace in Christ alone. And yet we know that faith without works is dead. And one of the clearest signs that you've been saved by the grace of God is that your life begins to embody the grace and and extend the grace of God to others, right? Uh, Faith without works is dead, right? And so uh, we're not saved by our works, but you can show your faith by your works. And Zacchaeus gets it, right? He understands that now since he's received this grace of Jesus, it now has to reorder every other area of his life which I love because Zacchaeus doesn't just welcome Jesus into his home. He welcomes him into into his life, into his heart, into every room in his house. And he says, Lord, I want you to take over. Even in my finances, I'm gonna, I've built my wealth upon the oppression of my own people, but now I'm willing to repent. And that turn, that posture in my heart is going to change in the way I relate to my finances and to my neighbors. I'm going to give back half of everything that I have. And four times that I've defrauded, I'm going to pay back to everyone that I have cheated. And so Jesus declares, surely this is someone who's bearing the fruit of salvation. Salvation has come to this house. See, I believe that Jesus calls us, whoever we are, to come to him just as we are. That's the good news of God's grace. You and I, we don't have to clean ourselves up before we can come into the presence of Jesus. We can come and we are invited to come just as we are. But the way grace works, it's so radical, it's so transformative, is that when we come to Jesus as we are, he doesn't leave us where we are. He transforms us from the inside out. He makes us look less like us and more like him. God's grace transforms us. So the invitation today 
is to come, to come down, to come to come down from hiding, to come down from the tree, to come down from where you are, to welcome Jesus into your home and to let him take over every area of your life. And that's the same invitation for you and for me to allow Jesus access and space in relationship, in community, in connection with him, to allow his grace to so transform our lives that it changes everything about us. God's grace pursues us. God's grace, it sometimes unsettles us. But thank God, God's grace transforms us. You know, I, I'm sitting here at my table, and this is a special place for me and for my family. It's our, it's, it's our home. It's, it's a table where those who I love most always have a seat. Well, you know, Jesus, Jesus has a table. And in the new kingdom, it's it's the great heavenly banquet. It's the wedding banquet of the king. And, and everyone is invited to come, to come and, and take a seat at his table. To, to gain entrance, you don't need to be a good person. You don't need to do good works. You don't need to, to tithe and give money to the church. You don't need to pray every day. You don't need to read your Bible. Although all of those things are good things. Entrance into his kingdom is based not on our merit, but on his. Jesus paid the price. Jesus lived the life you and I could never live. He lived the perfect life that reaches God's standard. He lived a sinless life. And then on the cross, he took the punishment for our sins that we deserve. And something amazing happens. The, the punishment that we deserve gets poured onto him and the righteousness, the crown that he deserves, gets freely given to us. It's all by grace. And the invitation today is to come to the table and receive the free gift that he has for each of us. As a reminder today of the gift of God's grace, we're going to move into a time of communion. And earlier today, we, we mentioned we want to invite you to receive the Lord's table as a family uh, in your home and to take whatever elements you have nearby, whether it be bread or juice, and, and receive the Lord's table together. I'm going to pray, and then as we close, I'm going to open up the Lord's table, and we're going to receive it together. So let's prepare our hearts to receive um, this reminder of what God has done. Lord, I want to say thanks for the reminder of your grace, and even that we get to come to the communion table and remember that there's nothing here that we've done, nothing that we deserve, but that really the, the bread is symbolic of your body, which was given to us. And the the juice or the wine, it's representative, Lord, of your blood, which was shed for the forgiveness of our sins so that every single one of us, no matter who we are, no matter where we are, no matter what we've done, no matter what our past looks like, Lord, we know that when we repent and turn to you in faith, when we believe in what you have done, we too can find forgiveness. We too can experience salvation. We too can experience transformation here and now that carries over into eternal life. So I pray for each and every one of us today that we would not go through this ritual, we would not go through this process, that we would that we would really that we would really experience this relationship that you have for each of us and this connection and this belonging that's available to each and every one of us today. Lord, we want to sit down. We want to find a seat at your table and find our home in you. So do this work in us and through us. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to invite you at this time to grab the, the bread or the juice, the water, whatever you have. And uh, I'm going to grab mine and we're going to receive the Lord's table together. You know, the scripture says that the Lord Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this whenever you eat it in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant, which is in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes.